What's going on guys, it's Pastor Josh. I'm so glad you're joining us today for the message, either on the website or on the app. If this ministry has been a blessing to you and to your family, I would encourage you to join us uh, in giving financially. You can do that if you'd like today in the link below. Um, and this is a great opportunity to continue to help us spread the word of God. Hope you enjoy the message. See you soon. Every week we've been going through this series now, got about two more weeks after this Sunday. And it will be starting a brand new series in October, but it's called Encountering Jesus, and it's all about the encounters that people had with Jesus when he was here in his earthly ministry, but the main point of it is we are to have, as followers of Jesus Christ, we're to have encounters with Jesus every day as we read his word, as we spend time in prayer, as we join one another, by the way, in life groups, they have been phenomenal. If you haven't gone to one, if you're new to our church, you're like, I don't even have a clue what that is. Grab me after the service. I'd love just to share with you. It's just life-changing to be amongst God's people. It's important for us in our spiritual growth and our spiritual health. So what we're looking for, though, today, as we look in Matthew 16, 13, if you want to turn there with me, Matthew 16, 13, we're looking at the confession of Peter, and it's a foundational confession of the church, and it really defines who we are as Christians, followers of Jesus, specifically as the church. Uh, what we're going to kind of touch on a little bit today is that there are many places, buildings that claim to be churches of Jesus Christ, but because of what they preach, because of what they embrace or do not embrace, they're not truly churches. Yes, they have someone speaking, and yes, they have music, and yes, they have whatever, but that's not what makes it the church. It's founded on the doctrinal statement where Peter does right here. He says, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God. And the implications of that are far larger than just the one sentence that he said. And Jesus commends him for this and says, this is a blessing that doesn't come from flesh and blood, which means it's not from just man. You didn't just reason this out. This is a gift from God the Father. And when we see, when we see our salvation as a gift, when we see the relationships that God has brought into our lives, for instance, the church gathering this morning, we don't count it as, well, I gotta go. No, 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 it's I get to be with my fellow brothers and sisters. I, I get to speak to my heavenly father no matter what I'm going through. I, I get to confess my sins unto him. And some are like, no one wants to confess sin. Do you wanna grow near unto the Lord? Do you wanna grow in your relationship with God? Then we what? We confess our sins. That's a daily thing. That's not once a year or once you get caught or once everything's falling apart and it feels like the walls are caving in on you. That's not then. It's a great time too. It's every day. It's every day that we confess. It's every day that we praise. It's every day that we ask God for help, not only in our own lives, but for those who are around us. Every single day. And so in Matthew 16, 13, some powerful text here. And by the way, before I get into it, this is, in some places here in this text, some of the most uh, argued upon, disagreed upon verses in all of Scripture. So I'm not planning on spending a ton of detail trying to argue every single side and then say, where do I land? I'm just going to land, and we'll go from there. If you have any questions, come up to me after service. It says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some people say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah and others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. And that is the word of the Lord this morning. Jesus takes his disciples up to the very northern part of Israel, all the way from back in the day when it was part of the tribe of Dan, the region that Dan resided in. Pagan worship had always been a part of it. Uh, Herod the Tetrarch, which is one of the sons of Herod the Great, who died around 4 BC, 
He created this area on a city that was already about 1,150 feet above sea level. And he created the town, and there was already a Caesarea, but it was on the edge of the coast of uh, the Mediterranean Sea. And so he called it Caesarea Philippi to make sure it was distinct. But he created this place, but it was primarily inhabited by Gentiles, by pagans, by those who believed in other gods, a, a, a duplicity of gods. And so it's, it's kind of strange, but at the same time, Jesus always has not a few steps ahead of us. He's always completely ahead of us. He takes them there to this place where all of these other gods are worshipped, and he asks them the question, who do people say that I am? Now, see, that's the question this morning. You want to get to the end of the message? Who is he? Because who he is matters tremendously. Not just in this life, it matters for the one to come. It matters completely. And everything about the rest of the text settles on that. Who is he and who do people say that he is? Who do people say you are? What do people talk about? What do they say about you? What, are they, what, are, what do they say? What are their descriptions of you? Let it roll in your head. Some of y'all are like, well, some people have told me exactly the way they think about me, and it wasn't that, it wasn't that good. Um, Praise the Lord, I'm changing, but uh, who I used to be is not who I am today, right? You know what I mean? We have some of that in our lives. Who do people say that you are? He was doing miracles. He was teaching with authority, right? I mean, this is a progressive thing. It's for you too, is it not? Every one of us who claim Christ, who know Christ, who are followers of Jesus right now, you know as well as I do, we are learning every single day more and more about him and more and more to trust him and that he is good even when we fail flat on our face. He still is there. Hebrews 2 says he's unashamed to call us brothers. Like he, He's not ashamed of us. He's unashamed. Like He proudly says these are my people. So number one, if you're taking notes down with me this morning in your worship guide or, or on the app, our understanding of Jesus' identity is a matter of eternal consequence. It's a, it's a matter of eternal consequence. It's not a small thing. It's not like, well, I, I think he's this, and you know, I'm cool with him being this, and I'm, I think he's someone like you know, Gandhi was a great guy, and, and Buddha, and Confucius, and, and Muhammad. I mean, like it's, he's one of those. He's a higher up. If that's what you believe, one could say, well, that's what you believe. But on the other side is, you don't know him. You don't know who he is if you compare him to other people. And that's really what he was getting at. Who do people say that I am? Faith is always educating me. Don't you love it when your kids get a little bit older and they start learning a few more complex things and you gotta remind yourself exactly how that math equation went? And I don't know about you, but I'm a long, I'm, I'm removed from school by a long ways, and, and I don't really care about a lot of stuff that doesn't benefit what I do on a daily. Um, there, there's a lot of things where I'm just like, man, I, I just, I don't remember how to do that. Why don't you tell me how to do it, honey? You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and she's telling me the other day about the Aztec Indians and their culture and their lifestyle, and she just started saying, Dad, you know this? I was like, well, yeah, I knew a little bit about it. Dad, did you know this? Did you know how many skulls they found? Did you know that they cut people right here across uh, as a sacrifice to the sun god and they ripped their heart out and pulled it out and let it beat in front of the sun to appease the sun god? And I'm like, yeah, it's pretty wild. You know, I mean, she just starts naming off all this stuff and how, how gruesome it was and all it did immediately was like, why do you think they did that? I don't know. Well, what, what, what informed them that the sun, being a god in their mind, needed the blood of human sacrifices, primarily of which are tribes of people or poor people, to be cut open at the top of their little pyramid-looking thing, right? I mean, it's like, well, what, made them, what made them do that, Faith? I said, it's what they believe. They believe that's a god. They believe that's a God, and because they believe that's a God, that informs the decisions that they make, the things that they choose to do, the things that they choose not to do. Now, the question again remains, who is Jesus? Because who he is, what he's accomplished, and what he commands of people who truly know him, it defines who you are. 
what you do and what you don't do, what you pursue and what you don't pursue, how you live and how you think. The gospel doesn't just change a cussing mouth. The gospel changes your heart from the inside out. You think that God's interested in your alcohol when God says, I'm going to tear the whole darn thing down. Everything about you needs to be renewed and regenerated by the Spirit of God. Everything about you. Start to finish. And God says, I'm going to do the work in you. And a lot of it's going to hurt in the process. But I will sanctify you. I will. He who began will finish his work. That's his promise. We should be amen in that. Because a lot of us, we know as well as other people in our own lives, we are not where or what we ought to be, but yet God tells us we have been justified by the blood of Jesus Christ, that we are being sanctified even as we sit here this morning, that the word of God is what, it's powerful and it does not return void, that it doesn't matter if you don't remember hardly anything I say, God's spirit is still at work in your life if you are a born again believer. God is still at work in your life. What we believe matters. It mattered to the communist who murdered millions. It mattered to the Nazi who murdered millions. It matters what you believe. It matters to our country. The things and the decisions that the leaders of our country are making is because of an ideology. That is an ideology that obviously it's not Christian. It's an ideology. If it's not Christian, then it must be demonically inspired. No one murders babies in the womb and somehow says that's a good idea. No one. That's not the sermon I'm preaching today, but do you understand what I'm saying? Our actions are informed by our thoughts, and therefore we've got to be what? Oh, so diligent to fill ourselves with the thoughts of God, with the word of God. He took them there because of all the idol worship within the region, with all the different things going on. He says, now who do people say that I am? Then he made it personal. Who do you say that I am? Because here's the answer. We can't all be right. All the religions of the world, we can't all be right. We're all saying different things. One of us got to be wrong. Or better yet, one right, rest wrong. Or heaven forbid, all wrong. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I say, we have the way, the truth, and the life. We fumble a bunch, bunch of mistakes, bunch of errors, bunch of division. But yet, He's faithful. See, Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace on earth. This is Matthew 10, 34. It's in your worship, God. I, I don't think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. He said, father's gonna be against son and, and mother's gonna be against daughter and father against son-in-law and, and mother against daughter-in-law. And he says, if you love them more than you love me, you're not worthy to follow me. And what does that mean? It means there's gonna be people in your very own household, in your very own family, they're not going to follow Jesus. And he's going to ask the question, and that includes your husband or your wife possibly, sad as that may be. Will you follow me? Do you love me? Or do you love the temporal comforts of this world and would rather follow someone else who's leading you off a cliff? He said, some people say John the Baptist. John the Baptist was preaching and proclaiming the coming of the Messiah, preaching and proclaiming repentance of sin. He said, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, because he was what, the weeping prophet for the most part. I mean, he had a powerful prophetic ministry, but he was also saying some stuff in there like there's a bunch of woes, there's some bad stuff going on. And and Jesus was always saying what? To the religious leaders who weren't following the very heart of God's word. He gave them woes as Derek was preaching about last Sunday. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, again and again and again. Then they said, one of the prophets. If someone told you this morning that they thought of you and they said, you know what? I think you got the qualities of King David. I think you got Abraham's faith in your life, right? Or I think you got Esther. I think you would stand up if the time called. I just see that inside of you. I see that courage inside of you. Or I see a Ruth inside of you just willing to step out in faith. If anyone said that about any of us, about any of the great people of faith, what would you do? Thank thank you? I mean, I I can't even believe that you would see something like that in me. I, I I don't even see that. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's a compliment. 
I mean, if someone said that about you and they said, man, I see something in you. You remind me of someone I read about in the Bible, not a bad character, a good one. That would just be like, yeah, man. Yeah, man. Th- I, I don't know how else to say, but thank you so much. When they said, man, you're like John the Baptist. You're like Elijah. You're like Jeremiah. Jesus said, you're not even getting close. Those people inspired by me. Those people were men of God, but here's the deal. They're not even in the same category, and he makes it personal. But who do you say that I am? Here we go, church. Who do you say that he is? Who is he? You see, they had good intentions with it, but they were missing the mark. The two storms that the disciples found themselves in, the first time the storm hits, and he rebukes it. He says, what kind of man is this? It says they worshiped him. Second storm hits when he walked on water two weeks ago. We talked about that. And they say, truly, this must be the son of God, right? They're getting closer. They're getting a little bit better of an idea. And now they say this, who do you say that I am? And Peter jumps up. Look at verse 16. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. This is the most explicitly correct answer to be given of the Lord, and the Lord commends it. He is the Messiah, not a human Messiah that is one of many that they thought was coming to save the day. No, no, he is the Messiah, the Messiah, the singular, the Son of God, which speaks not only to his humanity, but speaks also to the deity of Jesus Christ. You're not just a somebody or a bunch of other people coming through the ringer. No, 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 you are the Messiah. In every single biblical church, rises and falls on that. There are millions of churches that will agree to that statement, but the very activities that they embrace, in many cases, declare that they are not faithful to the teachings and obedience that is given to Jesus Christ. Who do you say Jesus is? Most everyone in here would say, I agree with that statement. You would add some words to it. You would add some adjectives to it. You'd say, he's many things. What does your lifestyle say that he is? I know what our lips say. What does our lifestyle say? I know what my lips say. What does my lifestyle say about him and who I believe him to be? Who do you say that I am. Colossians 1.10 in your worship God as well. It says this, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. You see in that? Walk means to live. Live, live in a manner worthy of the calling of Jesus Christ, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The calling that we have is a high calling. There's not a higher one. There's not a higher one than to be called a son or daughter of the most high God. There's not a higher one. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. What are we doing this morning? We're doing what? We're increasing in the knowledge of God. We're studying to learn. We say our catechism and we memorize Bible verses. We attend the groups. We pray. We do all of these things. Why? So that we might know him better, not just to know information about him, but we could spend time with him. Makes all the difference in the world. Secondly is this, your calling is greater than you know. And this is, this is something powerful that we need to grab a hold of. Look at verse 17. Your calling is just greater than you know. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Everybody had wrong ideas about the Messiah. They thought he was going to be this great patriot. They thought he was going to be a great warrior. They thought he was going to conquer and just destroy everybody. And all the people of Israel would be good to go then. This is the first declaration about the Messiah that is online with the biblical understanding. Does Peter still mess up after this? Yes. All you got to do is jump a few verses ahead, right? And he gets rebuked and says, Satan, get behind me. God's for God. God is for God. 
Peter makes this powerful declaration. Your calling by Jesus to join the covenant community is a gift. The more you understand it to be a gift, the more that you relish it. The more you understand the calling of God on your life, the faith, even the faith to believe, if, if the more you understand that to be a gift and not something you just welled up in yourself and some idea that just popped in your head, the more that you recognize that God gave you that gift, I don't understand how it would not cause you to worship. I don't understand how it would not cause you just to say, thank you, Lord. Why would you choose someone like me? And the answer is it's all grace. It's all grace. What do we deserve? Wages of sin, death. What's the free gift? Eternal life through Christ Jesus. I want justice. You want it? Every single word and every single action, every single thought that was wicked that you meditated upon, you want to be judged for that? The answer is no. May I be covered in the righteousness of Christ. He who knew no sin became sin so that we who were what? We who were filled with sin, we who were covered with sin, might become the righteousness of God. The more we see this as a gift, the more that we see that it is God acting and working inside of us, the more that we understand how grateful and thankful that should cause us to be. John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sends me draws him. It's God working, God drawing, God's pulling. God's capable. Mere human wisdom did not reveal this to Peter, and that's exactly what he says in verse 17. Remember this? Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. It's not a college education. It's not because you came from the right background or from the right neighborhood. It's, it's, it's none of the above. God revealed this to you, Peter. This is not something you just thought out or reasoned out. And do we think things out? Yes. Do we reason things out? Yes. Does it help to know more? Yes. But it is God who gives the gift. I want to tell you something. There are atheists out there who do not believe in a lick of this, but can quote the Bible far better than every single person in here, including myself. Are you following that this morning? There are atheists who claim there is no God, that there is no purpose within the world. Everything is random chance. Everything no purpose behind it, no creator behind it, no original cause behind it all, and they know the Bible better than every person, including myself, in here, and they do not believe. It is not about how much you know, though we are not to be ignorant, but it is the gift of God that one might believe. Charles Spurgeon, the same sun which melts wax hardens clay. And the same gospel which melts some persons to repentance hardens others in their sins. Have you not seen it? Have you not hung around Christianity long enough to see some people who gladly, they're just like, I love Jesus until what? Bad things come. Until tribulation or persecution or hard things. And all of a sudden, those same people said, oh, I love Jesus. They're out the door. And people asking me, what happened? Did you run them off? I'm like, no. They just stopped coming. It don't matter how good the music is. It don't matter how good the preaching is. It don't matter how good our children's programs are. This is not, God's kingdom is not built on gimmicks. I like to have fun just like the rest of you. But God's kingdom is built on the power of God and his grace and his mercy and the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. It's not built on the wisdom of man is simply not. It's my Father in heaven, he says, who has revealed this. Inside of your notes, or maybe it's not in the notes, but on the screen, it says, natural revelation declares the existence of, existence of a creator. But only in the person of Jesus Christ is the identity of God fully revealed. Creation tells you, man, someone had to have done something you see a beautiful painting and you say, there must have been someone who did what? They painted the picture. You say a complex vehicle or watch or whatever. You say someone had to have built the vehicle, built the watch, whatever that is. Every, there's always a cause behind everything that's out there that's beautiful. Psalms 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. Romans 1 says that they knew him and yet they rejected to worship him 
And rather they worship the creation rather than the what? The creator. That's how the progression goes. That's how the progression goes. You see, when we look at this, we find that this is not something that we conjure up. This is a gift from God himself. Now look at me, if you would, for just a moment. In verse 19 and 20, he says, and I will give you, this is Peter, I will give you, this is singular, not plural, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. What is he talking about keys? Like, where is that, what does that even mean? Peter recognized the first to recognize, and therefore Jesus says, I'm going to build my church upon this confession, upon you, Peter. And what do we see in the book of Acts? Acts chapter 2, verse 38, or chapter 3, verse 38, I believe. But what he does is he says this, how can we be saved? He says, repent of your sins, chapter 2. How can we be saved? Repent of your sins and believe. Chapter five, what does he say? Ananias, you sin against the Holy Spirit. We see the idea of loosing and binding. We're kind of like, what does that mean? He's over here saying, what does the gospel of Jesus Christ do? It sets us free. It sets us free. And when the word of God is proclaimed, people's hearts and eyes can be opened. And you're like, but not everybody responds. No, not everybody responds. But that's what the gospel does. And what he's saying is, what God has already predetermined, because the perfect tense right here is that it's already happening. Whatever you loose on earth has already been loosed in heaven. And whatever you bind on earth has already been bound in heaven. And we have a process and a part to play in that as well, do we not? And you're like, what do you mean? Well, chapter 18, verse 18, he's talking to all of them. And in each place he's talking to all of them, he's specifically talking about sin, and if he's talking to all of them, then that means he's also talking to all of us as his followers. What does it mean? It means every time you get to encounter someone and share with them the love of Jesus Christ, you are what? You are opening. Every single time you tell them about the love, every single time you support things of Christ's cause, every single time like we have a role to play in the church, your calling is greater than you know. It's not a small thing when you tell someone about Jesus. It's not a small thing when you give someone a meal or show an act of kindness in the name of Christ. It's not a small thing. It is a thing of eternal consequence whether they receive or reject. Whether they receive or reject, it is a matter of eternal consequence. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, speaking of the vision that John had of Jesus, Look at what he says. When I saw him, I fell on my feet as though dead, and he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. You ready for it? I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Keys. The imagery comes all the way back to Isaiah chapter 22 about the treasury, the one who held the keys. Keys are used for what? Unlocking or loosing? Binding or unlocking, right? Jesus is saying, I have the keys in the gates of what? Hades. My version right here, I love the ESV, but right here, to be honest, better word is Hades, not hell. Some people use this as an example, like we're gonna take the gates of hell. We're going. And there's a lot of intelligent people that kind of go in that direction, but in reality... What this is really saying, not even death, not even death is overcoming the church of God. There's not a single thing that can overcome the true church of God. Nothing. Not a thing. You should pray, and I should pray for our brothers and sisters in persecuted countries like Afghanistan. But God's church will prevail. You should pray for the church in America with all of our comforts and all of our luxuries. For many attend the buildings, but few most likely are a part of the body. It's kind of strange that he says in verse 20, he 
He says, then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. I mean, this is a revelation from God. Now, obviously, today, we're not strictly told to not tell anyone. We're told to tell what? Everyone. Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. Like, tell everybody. But at this point in time in his ministry, because everybody was going to misunderstand and misrepresent who the true Messiah was, what did he tell them? He said, don't tell anybody. And then in every single one of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Every single one of them has the same account in it. And after that account, every single one of them has Jesus for the first time telling them that the Messiah will what? Suffer and die and raise again from the dead after three days. And this is where Peter comes and pulls him to the side and says, you, that will not happen to you. You will never die. Like, it will never happen to you. He says, get behind me, Satan, for you have what? You have the ways of man in your heart. You do not have the thoughts of God. This is right after he made that statement and the lights went out. <laughs> we like theatrics in here. But what I said earlier still matters. The idea is this what? It's not gimmicks. They were going to have to know that he was the Christ according to the witness and according to the testimony, according to his life. We make the gospel so cheap when it's always about how do we sucker them in? What do you mean, sucker them in? We're giving away iPads. Come to church. Of course they'll come. Not for Jesus. They want the iPad. Why are you making fun of other churches, Josh? Who says they're not Sardis? They had a name. He said, but you're dead. So this leads me to my close. Jesus' true church, built on Peter's confession, will prevail. I shouldn't have to say it like that, but the only way I think that really gets the point across is to say the true church. That's opposed to the false church. Jesus compares it to wheat and tare, from a distance, they look exactly the same, right? Like, we, we sit among one another. I don't know your heart. If I know you enough, I know your actions. And you don't know my heart. But if you know me enough, you know my actions. And it says that followers of Jesus Christ, they will bear fruit. They will. No doubt about it. You will bear fruit of righteousness. And you will grow continually in Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, self-control, all of those things, without a doubt. You see, the declaration of you are the Christ, the son of the living God, and that plays into everything, everything. What you believe about Jesus, what you believe about him, he declares the word of God to be true. Do you believe the word of God is true? He declares that marriage is between one man and one woman. Do you believe that? He declares that every single person, no matter how wicked at times they are, they're created in the image of God. You believe that? I mean, he goes on. So you can't just say, well, I believe a little bit about what Jesus says, but I don't like the Old Testament and I don't like part of the New Testament. I'm just gonna believe what I wanna believe. He doesn't give you the choice. And sadly, there are so many large denominations, which of course are falling off the face of the earth, that have totally rejected the truth. Totally rejected the truth. Episcopal Church, Lutheran Church, United Church of Christ, Presbyterian Church USA, and please don't call Mormon churches, churches of the Latter-day Saints of Jesus Christ, or Jehovah Witnesses churches. They're not, they're cults. That building across from North Dakota that is a cult meeting. I know it looks pretty and they got the steeple. It's, it's a cult. You're hating them. No, I'm calling it for what it is. Tell your children, that's not a church. That's a cult. Everyone says the church is dying. <laughs> what did Jesus say? Verse 18. And I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock, play on his name and play on words. 
I will build my church, and the gates of hell, Hades, shall not prevail against it. I don't know about you, but I like to win. I'm not betting against God. What if you all leave? Well, I still believe. I pray. What if your best friend disown you? You still believe. What if all the world turns against you? Will you still believe? 2 Timothy 2, 19. God's firm foundation stands. It's not moving, stands. Bearing this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. The Lord knows I think Abraham Lincoln said something like this. If I misquote it, forgive me. You can fool everyone some of the time, and some of the people all the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. You've never fooled God. He cannot be mocked. Hebrews 4.13 says that we are naked and exposed before him, which is another way of saying there is not a single thought God doesn't already know about you. And this is why we go back to the original question. Who do you say that I am? It matters for all of eternity. There's a guy on YouTube. He's actually John Piper's son, which is John Piper, man. He's a great guy. Loves Jesus, but his son, out of all his children, Staunch atheist, hates Christianity. And he makes all of these um, posts or whatever. And one of those posts, he said, you know, churches won't even be honest with you. He said, they're inviting you to church. He says, but they won't tell you that they believe everybody's going to hell who doesn't believe. He says, but they won't tell nobody that. He says, isn't that hypocritical? And sadly, most churches won't warn you. Those who reject Jesus do not just disappear. It says the torment of their ashes, Revelation 14, go up forever and ever and ever in the presence of the Lamb. You're like, why are you going to end on a sad note like that? Because you got one life to live. You better live it well. And there's only one well, and that's knowing Jesus as Lord, as Savior, as the Christ, Son of the living God. Let's praise and stand as we partake in the Lord's Supper. Father, we come before you, Lord God, thanking you that, Father, you sent your Son, Jesus. You sent your Son, Jesus, to die for our sins. For we are incapable of keeping your law. We're incapable of making our wrongs right. We're ineffective. But yet you freely call us to believe on the name of Jesus. And as we take of the Lord's Supper, as we take communion as a community of believers, we are reminded of what Jesus has done for us. We are reminded of the freedom that has been won at the foot of the cross. We are reminded of the blood of Jesus, the precious blood of the king himself, which was poured out for wicked people just like me. May we not take lightly of the bread. May we not take lightly of the cup. May we rejoice in our salvation. May we be just, Lord God, may we be able to share the gospel in our home, with our family that's extended, Lord God, with our coworkers and our friends. Lord, might we invite and might we share and might we love and be practical about such things. Let us not waste our lives. Let us walk well. May this be for our spiritual strengthening. May this be for our remembrance. 
Lord God, may you do a work right now in our lives as we partake of the cup and partake of the bread. It is in Jesus we pray. Amen.